We had okay. six people come to the Lord. How I many that's God moving when six people get saved? Amen. 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 You can say what you want to, but praise God. That's God moving. This thing's a little loose. Hope I got it in there right. Anyhow, I think it's working right now. I think it's a little loose. Huh? Yeah. 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 Praise God. There you go. Uh, we got the other mic in case it goes out. We'll be all right. Uh, last Sunday we had six people get saved. I think that was one of them. People get saved. That's what it's all about. Amen, church. I tell you, the church is doing something right when people are finding Jesus. You, know, they can, you, you can shout until you're blue in the face, but if anybody gets saved, you've got a problem. Amen. We had six come to the Lord. And we preached a message about uh, Mother's Day. We preached on the women of God. We never finished it about the great women of God. So I had a lot of people ask me, said they were just so moved by that sermon last week when I could finish it. I think that's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to talk about the great women of God. Please turn to somebody beside you if you're a woman. If she's a woman, look at her and say, are you a great woman of God? Praise God. And then look at her one more time and say, I believe you're going to be a great woman of God. One of the great women in the New Testament was the mother of Jesus. It was Mary. We probably won't get to Mary today, but let's, let's read what she had to say when she found out, or uh, when she went to visit Elizabeth. And uh, she said, look in verse 46. This is one of the uh, greatest prayers that was ever prayed. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, the word Mary means bitter because she was going to have to face some bitter things in her life. And verse 46 of the first chapter of Luke says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low state of his handmaid, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done great things, and holy is his name. His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud, the imaginations of their hearts, he has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them in a low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent them to your way. He has hoped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers and to Abraham and to his seed forever. Let's give God a praise for you. Yeah, how do you church Bibles? Hallelujah. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit. My, if my mic ring goes out, so I'm just going to I'm, I'm probably moving around a lot. Last Sunday I preached. I think this Sunday I'm going to preach a little bit. Is that all right with you? I'm enjoying the preaching as much as the teaching. I'm sick Sunday. Hallelujah. Well, you either like the teaching show up tonight. That's where, do you know what I taught Wednesday night? I taught four, I 14 ways to deal with with people. Fourteen ways. How to deal with the unsaved, the saved, how to deal with false religion, how to how to deal with uh, lazy people, how to deal with hardworking people. There's fourteen different ways I taught Wednesday. It would do you well to get that CD and listen on how to deal with people. Amen. Amen. But this morning we're going to talk about these great women in the Bible. We can glean some things from them. We can be encouraged. You men can be encouraged because if a woman can do it, I'm going to know you can do it. Amen. Amen. And so these women were women of strength and power. Last Sunday morning we taught on six of them. We taught on Sarah. We taught on Rebecca. We taught on Rachel, which are the mothers of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was their wives. We taught on Ruth. We taught on Deborah. We taught what their names mean. Deborah means the bee or the stinging bee. A lot of people feel like women are of a lower class or something or beneath me. And just because uh, the Bible says wives be subject unto your husbands, okay? And they, they look at two scriptures in the Bible. One of the scriptures says, let the woman remain. I, I suffer not a woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. And this is found over in the book of Timothy. 
And they, 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 they use that scripture, a lot of these are scriptures that say women aren't supposed to teach and women aren't supposed to preach. But you see, to understand scripture, a lot of times you just can't take one verse and pick it out. Amen. Okay? Because it even talks about the Dallas Cowboys in the Bible scripture. Amen? It says those creeping things. <laughs> Huh? I mean, you can make it say anything, amen? amen. But uh, 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 in that scripture in Timothy where it says, I suffer not a woman to teach you usurp authority over the man, they'll read that and they'll apply it to you ladies, but that's not, they're applying it wrong. Because you've got to read the verse behind it. Okay? What's the verse behind it say? The verse behind it say, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Why does it say that? Why did he put that behind that? Because in this word, a uh, woman here, suffer not a woman to teach you, you serve authority over the man. The word woman and man are the Greek words husband and wife. It's not a reference to a woman teaching in church. It's a reference to a woman being in, in her home that she's subject unto the man, okay? Now, though you're subject unto the man, that was a curse that was given on Adam and Eve back when they failed. Though you're subject to the man, the man's supposed to honor you and respect you and love you, even as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it. So it isn't a place of dishonor, it's a place of honor. Yes. Then you have another scripture in Corinthians 15 talks about the woman, said, uh, uh, talks about the woman, be, let the woman keep solid in the worship service. And, she had, and again, it's a reference to husbands and wives. Because the next verse, read the next verse. Next verse says, but she, if she has to ask anything, let her wait until she gets home and ask her husband at all. See, in Jewish times, they worship in two separate places. Men and women didn't worship together. Holy Spirit would follow them to men, and the women get all excited. And then would start hollering, hey, what's going on over there? Well, you know, uh, tell us what's going on, and it would interrupt the flow of the Spirit. So both of these are reference to husband and wife. So let me, let me say this to you. You can't teach and preach in the Word of God in the Bible. Amen. Let nobody tell you. I don't care what religions denounce that as uh, not right, but, but it's not a reference at all to you. It's a reference to uh, uh, husbands and wives. How many enjoyed that teaching? Amen. Just threw that in there for just good word. Praise Amen. God. Uh, we taught on uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six of these women, six of these women. We taught on. Uh, this morning we're going to teach on a few more. The one we're, first one we're going to talk about is doesn't have a name in the Bible, and her name isn't in the Bible. Uh, uh, she, but she is mentioned quite a bit in First, Second Kings, chapter four. And it is the woman of Shush, Shui. They call her the Shudamite woman. And she was a great woman in the Bible. And uh, how many of you ain't got to have a name to be great? Amen. 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 You know, just like uh, uh, your position in Christ Jesus isn't based on your name. It's based on your walk with God. Amen. Can I give an amen? amen? The Shudamite woman was a woman who was very wealthy. She was very rich in her time as most people would say because she had an extra room in her house and she and she uh, and her husband uh, were together very wealthy with people and uh, but she had no children she didn't have any children I have found out that a lot of the women in the Bible especially the women like uh, Rebecca uh, uh, Sarah all of them for some reason seem to have problems bearing children one of their great rewards was that they started having children. Nowadays we have less children than we did back then in those days, but it was a great to be able to have children. She was, she, the Shunammite woman was bare, was barren. She didn't have no kids. But she had a love for God. How many know the love of God will take you a long places? Amen. How many know the love of God will get you in the divine will of God? Amen. Now she was married to a good man. Uh, doesn't give you what his name was. Uh, uh, it, it, it begins to tell you uh, it doesn't give what her name is anyhow it doesn't give his name but she saw a prophet one day and that prophet was the prophet Elisha and she saw him traveling the road for, to Samaria and back and forth from Samaria and his a servant was a man named Gehazi and they would travel and she went to her husband and she said to her husband said 
This man is something different about him. How many know that when you get around God's men, there's something different about them? Amen. Around the women of God, how many there's something different around them that have that walk in Christ Jesus? Amen. You know it because you're around it. You can feel that power. You can feel that presence of God. Well, she knew something. She knew what Roman 8, Romans 8 says. Roman 8 says, We will bear witness with one another. My spirit will bear witness with your spirit that we are the children of God. How do you feel the Lord in the house right now? That's a witness of the Holy Ghost. That's a witness of the Spirit that the man of God is talking to you and you can feel that power. I don't know about you, but I feel chills. You know, when Tommy walked into the church this morning, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, before church started, as he walked by me, he stopped. He said, do you feel that? I said, I sure do. And the hair was standing up on his arm and goosebumps up and down his arm. Why? Because we could feel that power. We could feel that presence. You don't come to church because we have great music. You come to church because you feel the power of God. And people will sell out God for a pat on the back. Good work. They'll sell out God so they can live and do whatever they want to do. You, you can't sell God out for just anything. Do you understand what I mean? Because God is the most valuable thing that you have in your life. He's better than the pat on the back of the new clothes. He's better than the home and the new car. God's, God's, the power of God is better than going to the church where there's people that, that's not like you. Can I get it? Amen. You want to go where God is. Oh, yes. and I'm going to tell you what. God was born of a woman in a manger in a stall. Yes. Amen. Praise God. What we see is not very valuable. Became the greatest king on all the earth yes. and in all the universe. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. All over. God's all over the church. I tell you in the house. The Shulamite woman was a spiritual leader of her family. In other words, the man was. The scripture didn't talk much about the man. The woman made all the spiritual leaders. But here's the thing. Even though she was a spiritual leader, she didn't run off and leave her husband. When she'd done something, she came to her husband and uh, talked it over with him and said, uh, do you think that we can fix a place? Because I feel like there's something special about this man. I feel like he's <coughs> a man of God. Can we fix a place to entertain him and, and, and take care of him? And so when, uh, when Elisha came through and his uh, servant Gehazi came through, they fixed a place and a bed and a room for him so that he could dwell in this kind of like a cellar, cellar uh, or not a cellar, but a, a loft type, type place so he could go in and he could lay down and he could rest and she prepared him meals and, and everything. Because you see, sometimes some of your greatest blessings is loving the children of God. Amen. Oh, anybody hear what I say? Somebody said, oh, I want to be blessed. Well, they love the children of God. Do something for the children of God. Respect the children of God. And how many of the blessings of God will hunt you down and overtake you in the name of Jesus? She fixed a special place for him. After about four years of doing this, notice four years. Notice that it's four years. Four years she kept doing this. Every time he'd come back, come on in, let's fix you something. Stay as long as you want. Pray as much as you want. Do you have any need? Can I meet your need? What do you need? Do you need some food to go? What do you need? Some money? She's met his need for four years, and after four years, uh, God spoke to her. Uh, a, uh, Elisha the prophet said, you need to do something for this woman. You see, faithfulness isn't based on 30 days. Oh, did you hear what I said? Faithfulness is based on one year, two years. It was four years before the promise of God came in her life. And then Elisha said to her, said, all right, I'm good. the Lord's going to bless you. You're going to have a child. And she merely talks back to him and said, don't tell me something like that because it's the desire of my heart. It's what I really want. But see, she remembered Sarah. God told Sarah, I'm going to give you a child. But Sarah didn't get it in four years. She didn't get it in 10 years. She didn't get it in 20 years. 25 years later, after she got the promise of God, it showed up. You can't give up on God's promise just because it takes a little time to get to you. Oh, I'm going to feel God in this house this morning. Put your hand over here and say, I cannot give up on the promises of God. No matter what kind of shape I'm in, no matter what I'm going through, 
I'm going to receive the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Elisha the prophet says to the shooter my woman, said, You're going to have a child. She said, Oh, don't tell me that. He said, Yes, you are. You're going to have a child. And sure enough, she has a baby. She has a child, a young boy. It's the love of her life. Stuff that she cared so much about. But you know, as we journey through life, enemies sometimes will try to still rob us of the things that God's given us. Amen. The blessings that God has given us. Amen. Amen. Well, he went out one day with Daddy to work in the field. When he was out working in the field, he had a sunstroke. And he dies. He comes and said, oh, my head, my head. And he goes, they carry him into his mother, and he dies in her arms. He's about four or five years old. He's out there with Daddy in the field, and he dies. She immediately grabs him and picks him up, and she takes him up to where the prophets have been praying. She wants to get him back to where the prophets have been in touch with God. How it would do us, us all well to learn where you have experienced yes. God. And then when you're in the middle of the trouble, you run to that place and find God. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen. So run to where it is. You know, I remember when I had one of the greatest troubles in my life that I ever experienced in my life. People say, what did you do? I had a key to the church. I ran to the church, opened the door, ran up on the platform, picked the gear, guitar up, and began to play the song, Where Could I Go But To The Lord? And God answered my prayer. God healed my mind. God healed my body and restored my walk. How many know that God can do those things? If you can run to God instead of running to your psychologist or running to your neighbor, run to your gossip friend or run to your pill bottle or run to your alcohol bottle. If you run to God, God will restore you and God will heal what the enemy has stolen from you. Shoot him out, woman. Said, Don't touch him. Shut the door. Leave him alone. She laid him on the bed and she got on a horse and some 30 miles away. The prophet Elisha was in Samaria, some 30 miles away. She took her servant. She told her servant, said, Run ahead and tell him I'm on my way. And so she runs overnight. She about runs the horse to death or whatever she was on. She runs into death trying to get to the prophet. And they see her from afar off. And Elisha says, says to Gehazi, this doesn't look good. I got news from you. God can see your problems from afar off. Amen. Oh, I felt the Holy Ghost in there. I said God sees the trouble coming. Let me tell you what. He sees the trouble coming down the road way before you yeah. see it. Yeah. There's nothing in your life that's going to sneak up on God. Amen. Or your marriage, or your home, or your job. If you lost your job, God knows about it. Amen. If He knows there's going to be a problem in the marriage, God knows about it. And I got some good news for you. You just need to keep walking by faith. Yeah. If you keep walking by faith, God can solve your problems. Yeah. I said God can solve your problems. I don't care what they are. God can solve your problems. So Elijah says to Gehazi, go meet her. Gehazi runs out to meet her. He runs out to meet her. He said, what's wrong? We know about your attitude and the way you're running and what's going on. There's something wrong. And the woman said, uh, the woman said to him, all is well. Her boy's laying dead. Yeah, come on. But all is well. Yes. You see, the problem was she didn't want to get to the preacher, which was Gehazi. She wanted to get to the master. Yeah. See, you've got to get past the preacher sometime if you want to get your answer in life. Yeah. Not all your preachers has the answer. Yeah. The man that has the answer is your master. Yeah. The man who has the answer is God Almighty. Yeah. You sometimes got to get past the crowd. Sometimes you got to get past the singers. Sometimes you got to get past the preachers. You got to get to God for yourself. You need to find an altar and get on your knees and say, God, I need your help in this situation. You take charge, God. I know that you can do it. All is well. Oh, I feel the Lord. All is well. Lord. She said, Preacher, you're fine and I love you, but I ain't got time to sit here and talk to you about the answer. I've got to get to the answer. She said, Get out of my way. Where's that prophet? <laughs> Hallelujah. I've got to get to somebody say to me, I've got to get to the answer. I've got to get past that preacher. Hallelujah. I've got to get to the answer in God. So she kneels at the feet of Elisha. She falls down at his feet. And he said, What's the matter? 
She said, my son is dead. My son has passed away. What are you going to do about it? Sometimes you got to throw it at the feet of Jesus and ask him, what are you going to do about this? Yeah. Things is tough. Things, yeah. The money ain't coming in. I need some help. you got to kill, you got to kill one of those cows that you've got up there. Yeah. Hallelujah. you gotta, you got to meet my need. How many of God can meet your need? Yeah. Say that to me, God can meet my need. God can meet my need. woman is at the feet and Elijah has it. Uh, a pad plant, and he says to Gehazi, I take my staff and run ahead of us and put the staff on the boy's face and see if God will bring him back. And so when she leaves, the Shulamite woman says, No, I'm not going with him. I, I'm, I'm not going with, with the preacher. I'm going with the man who, who, told, who gave me the miracle. He said, I'm staying right here at your feet. I ain't going nowhere until you go. Yeah. And so she pushes. Elisha enough to where he gets up. Sorry, let's go. Head back to the house. He's come back to the house. Gehazi's out in front of him. He takes the staff, lays it on the boy's face. He doesn't come back to life. He still did. Gehazi comes out. Uh, uh, Gehazi comes out to Elisha. Said we've laid the staff and there's no hope. He's already gone. He, he, you know we've we've tried. See, sometimes you got to get beyond trying. You got to get at the feet of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Did anybody hear what I said? You gotta get the old trying. You gotta get see trying sometimes will make you justify, make you feel good, but that isn't the answer. Do you understand? The answer is I'm not leaving till I get the answer. I'm not giving up till you make it happen. I'm not gonna get anywhere away from it till you come into this situation and you change this situation. You're my God. You said you can do it, and I know you can do it. Isn't God good? All the time. All the time. So Elisha goes upstairs. She, she takes the little boy and he, he starts praying for him. It doesn't happen right away. You know, sometimes your miracles just don't happen right away. Amen. But he lay, the Bible said he put his face against his face and his lips against his lips and he breathed into his body. Okay? And said he did that for a while and he said he felt like he was a little warmer because of the breath breathing. But he got down by his knees at the bed and prayed some more. And then he got up and did the same thing over again. See, so God's a God of repetition. Yeah. Do you know that the first miracle was turning the water into wine, all right? But the second miracle was healing a man at Capernaum. And, and why, why are you telling us that? Because God left to where he was at and went back to where he had the first miracle to perform the second miracle. Why? Because he's a God of repetition. Yeah. That's why you come to church and you hear the same old message or different message. I hope they're anointed message. Right. You know, you can take the same message. I preach the same message more than once but never preach it the same way. Yeah. Because the anointing of the Lord comes up on you. I believe God can take water and turn it into water. Yeah. Can I get an amen? Yeah. I believe God can say rock and it becomes a rock again. Can I... How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. You just get a hold of the power of God and the Spirit of God and He'll make things all right in your life. Amen. I feel the Lord in here. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Shulamite woman, he breathes. And the Bible said he sneezed seven times. Got his respiratory system started again. And then he hollered for the woman and said, Come on up and get your boy. Well, can't you see the look on her face? When she came in there, you know, me and my son Scott, I tell the story many times, I cry every time I tell it. Me and my boy Scott was living on a farm. Scott was a baby, or a little old boy. And uh, we were living on a farm. And there was no way in and out of the, to the farm. The road was so bad, you didn't have a car that could go up in there. So the only way out was a tractor. We had a tractor, which took us in and out of the holler down to the farm, down to the car. And me and Scott got on that tractor and he said, Daddy, can I go with you to the store? I said, well, you sure can. So he gets up, and he's real small, and he gets up underneath the seat like, right beside me. And it's a tricycle front end. Does anybody know what a tricycle front end is on a tractor? That means when you make left, you go left. It ain't no making a big circle, you go left. Now, me and him driving down the road, and Scott grabs my shirt. He says, Daddy, he said, uh, he said something to him. I was, and I looked back and said, son, just sit there and be quiet. And when I looked back up, well, I looked back at him, I turned that wheel to the left. And that tractor dropped over a mountain. 
and I reached back for Scott to grab him. And when I seen the tractor go over the mountain, I reached back to uh, grab him. And it's just a hurling from the tractor. But he got scared and he went back up underneath the seat. Do you know the terror that went through me when that tractor rolled over? And landed upside down on the, at the foot of that mountain. Do you, you know the fear and the terror that was inside me? I screamed, Oh God, save my boy. So that tractor rolled over the hill, landed upside down. Said, God, save me. I started, God. Just for a brief second, I didn't hear anything, and all of a sudden, the voice said, I'm right here, Dad. <laughs> See, it hurled me off the tractor down, down through the field. It hurled me off, and I jumped up and screamed, Scott. And I ran back up and looked, and he landed. The tractor uh, seat was buried about six inches in the ground, and the wheels had stopped the tractor from going down upside down. And I looked, and he had landed between the wheel and the seat. And I just went in there and grabbed his trout. His leg, and I drug him out underneath that tractor. And I dropped to my knees, wrapped my arms around him. Must have cried for 20 minutes because God took care of my boy. I know what this woman felt when she seen that, seen that baby there. She, she dropped on her knees, and the Bible tells us that she. When she dropped down, she did leave the feet of Elisha. She dropped down at the feet of Elisha. Sometimes we got to get at the feet of God to get our prayers answered. You got, and when you drop down there, you can't turn loose. You got to get humble. You got to be like that. Be like that one woman in the Bible. The Bible said she, you, uh, Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany. Bible tells us that when she anointed Jesus, she anointed his feet and began to clean and wipe it with the hair of her. Now that's adoration. Yeah. Now that is love. How many of you love God? How many know that you can be thankful that your children are still alive and they didn't die in that car wreck? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the prayers of your mother and father are with you. Restored the boy. Later on we find the story as you study it out. The Shulamite woman uh, actually gets a warning from Elisha, there's going to be seven years of famine, you better leave. She takes her boy, doesn't tell where her husband is now, he evidently has died, but she's got the young boy still with her. And later on she goes, Elisha tells her, you better leave, a famine's coming on the land. And so she takes her boy and she leaves, and she's living in a city, and she's very, very poor, and she can't already make enough of her and the little boy the young man to eat. He's grown up to be a teenager. To eat. And when she's in this place, the king of the city hears about the miracles of Elisha. And he said, and, and he hears about the story of raising the Shudamite woman's uh, boy from the dead. And when he hears it, he calls her to him and he says to her, said, tell me the story of Elisha. And she tells the king about how God raised her boy from the dead. And, and the king wants a part of the blessing. So he says to the woman, said, I'm going to restore all that you've lost. Amen. How many, no matter where God sends you, what you go through, God can restore everything you have lost. Amen. How many know God can even take the wicked to restore what, what, what the enemy has stolen from you? Amen. Somebody asked him one time, he said, well, said, would you take money about paying for the lottery? I said, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. <laughs> Amen. How many enjoyed his teaching so far? Amen. So he restores it. The second woman I want to talk about is a woman named Abigail. And her name means joy. Her name means joy. She's a noble queen. She becomes the wife of King David. Are y'all enjoying this teaching in these people? She becomes a wife of King David. She was, uh, she was married to a man named Nabal. And he was a wicked man. He was a very uh, facetious man. He, 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 all he cared about was money. He hated King David. King David was with his 600 men sent word to Nabal and said, we are hungry. Saul is chasing us into the mountains. 
and we, you know, we, we kind of protected your flock from thieves and stuff. Would you feed us? And Nabal, being a drunk heather, uh, sends word back to him, I'm not going to do anything for him. David gets very angry, and he decides I'm going to go kill Nabal and everybody that belongs to Nabal. The queen, or the one the queen at that time, but Abigail, okay, hears this conversation that's going on and by her husband. And Abigail loads up all the mules and all the th servants that she has, takes all the food, and she goes down and she falls at the feet of David. And she tells David, said, you know, let us feed you, let us take care of you. I'm sorry that my heathenistic husband treated you this way. Now here's what speaks admiration for the woman. Here's what speaks admiration for her. She, she stopped the wrath of David. David was going to kill the whole bunch. She stopped the wrath of David. Are you with me? You know, I love God because sometimes somebody can say a word that will move God and God will do great things. Ooh, how many feel the Holy Ghost? And she stopped the wrath of the king and she took care of him. Now here's this, here speaks the greatness of the woman. She lived with a horrible drunk. Are you with me now? She lived, he probably beat her when he got drunk. She lived with this horrible man. But even when she could have went with David, she didn't do it. She honored her marriage. She loved God and her vows to God more than the pleasures of this life. Oh, there are few people in this world who will, who will stick with somebody, even though the person is hard. I know there's some women in this church right here who's lived with absolutely hell. Can I get an amen? amen? And you stuck with that man. You went through that, that mess after mess. Either he killed himself or he, he left you for another woman or did something horrible to you. But you held your favor. You stuck to your guns. You put God first in your life. I want to know something for you. God will make a plan for you and God will make a way out for you. Amen. Just keep hanging on Jesus and get the favor of God moving in your life. Honor your vows until death do we. I mean, until the Lord is here. Until death do we part. Until death, oh yeah, oh yeah. Until death do we part. Hallelujah. Abigail turns the wrath of David and goes back to her husband, Nabal. And when she goes back to him, ten days later, Nabal dies. And David hears about it. You know, it's very important that you sow now so that you can reap later. Oh, I don't think anybody heard what I said. I think it's important you sow now so you can reap later. Uh, Abigail sowed in the life of David. Okay? And David was not the king. David was an outlaw. He was called an outlaw by Saul and by Nabal and all those different people in the kingdom. They called him an outlaw. They called him a heathen. But you know what? Her faith was in God. How many of God can turn your outlaw into a king? Amen. Oh, glory to God. Ten days later, Nabal dies. Dies of a stroke. He dies. And when he dies, they tell David, said Abigail, husband is dead. One much later than that, David sent word to her and said, come on. I want you to be my wife. He takes Abigail. Now here's, the, here's what speaks greatness about this woman, this queen. She became the wife of David while he was there, still in that All right? And she had to live with him wherever he went and whatever he done through whatever he done. But one day it took her to the seat of being a queen. You know, they may call you an outlaw because you believe in the power of God and the strength of the Lord. But one day, you will be seated with Christ Jesus as the bride of Christ. Come on. Some of you can call me an outlaw. You can call me anything you want to. As long as Jesus calls me the bride, then I get ready to go on. Oh, give God praise. Can I preach one more? I had six more to preach. I'm going to preach one more. The next one we want to preach about is also a woman of the Old Testament. This is the last one I'll talk about in the Old Testament. And her name was Esther. Esther means star. Uh, she was named uh, after the heathen god Astar, 
which is what they use for Easter. A lot of times, a lot of people don't even like calling it Easter. Most people call it the resurrection, okay? Because Easter is a reference to uh, Astol, or the heathen god of the spring, okay? The book of Red. Now, here, let me tell you something that's interesting about Esther. Esther, in the book of Esther, there's ten chapters in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, God is not mentioned one time. Not one time is the word God mentioned in the book of Esther. Are you with me now? But the whole message is about God's divine plan and God's divine providence. Because Esther was a woman that the children of Israel had been took into captivity in the Persian Empire. The king was a man named Artaxerxes, okay? And also his name was Hashirus, okay? He, he died, I mean, his wife, uh, Queen Vesachi, uh, dies. And when she dies, he's looking for another queen. Now, see, God has a divine plan in your life. Please turn somebody to say, say, God has a divine plan in the life, in the life of, you of you and your children. How many feel the Lord in here? Okay. Well, while, while they were in captivity in Persia under Artaxerxes, while they're in, while they're in captivity there, there was a man named uh, Haman, and he was one of the king's envoys. He was close to the king. But it, he was a type of Satan. He was a type of the devil. He hated the children of Israel. He wanted them killed. He actually went and made ten gallows though, so he could hang every one of them on the gallows. And back in those times, they had a, a law that you could not approach the, the king at any time unless he held your scepter out for you. Because if you did approach him without being told that you could approach him, they took you out and they killed you right there on the spot. So Queen Vesey dies, and when she dies, they're looking for another queen. Now Esther, according to Scripture, was one of the most beautiful women that ever lived. She was that, she was that beautiful. She was pretty. So she was rounded up with the other king, uh, uh, women, to see who was going to replace the queen. <coughs> but she was commanded by her, by her uncle, Mordecai, don't tell him who you are. Don't tell him that you're a Jew. Because God's put you in, ooh, I feel the Lord, has put you in this position for such a time as this. Don't tell. Sometimes you can't tell people the plan that God has in your life. Do you know times that God has spoken to me. I want to get up on the platform and say, this is what the Lord is going to do, but I had to keep my mouth shut. Yeah. When I was at the old church, I told God's folks said, you're going to build a church. I put the money in your hands and you're going to build a church. I wanted to stand on the platform and say, oh, everybody rejoice. God is going to do it. But it was a year or two later that I was able to say that. There was times, there's times when God's talking to you. You've got to keep your mouth shut. Yeah. And don't let the devil steal and rob you of your blessing. Let me feel the Lord. Don't let the devil steal and rob you of your blessing. Mordecai says to Esther, don't tell him that you're a Jew. Because something's going on and God's got a plan. She said, well, I don't want to do it because if I approach him and I don't do it right, he said, they'll kill me. And, God, and, and, and Mordecai says to Esther, if you don't do it, God's got somebody else that will do it. Come on, turn to somebody beside and say, if you don't fulfill your plan, God's got somebody that will take your place. Church ain't going to stop just because the preacher quits. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you don't want to do it, God's got somebody that will. Mordecai says to Esther, said, it's up to you to make this sacrifice. You know, God calls us to do great things, and sometimes it's a risk to your life. You know, we took uh, 15 people or 16 people into Mexico about two years ago. We went into Mexico. We were not in Mexico more than 30 minutes. Now, I got a van full of you, church people, saints, you. I got a van full of them. And we're sitting there, and I, I'm wore out. We done flew to Guadalajara. Uh, and, and we went to Atlanta, flew to Guadalajara, and I'm just wore out, and I'm sitting in this hot van, no air conditioning. 
in Mexico with 15 of my church members, and my head laying back in the seat, and somebody said, uh-oh, how many know that got my attention? Oh my, I said, what's wrong? I said, there's, there's a truck behind us with the lights flashing. And we look, and it's, it's the police. They pull us over, they jump out with machine guns. Now, I ain't been in country 20 minutes. All right, maybe 30 minutes in country, and these men jump out in suits. They got it's hot, so they got the suit off. They got shirt and ties, but they got machine guns, little short machine guns with straps around them. And they, one of them's at the back of the church, one standing at the church. That's a church. One of them's at the back of the van. The other one runs up to the side of the van, and points the machine gun. The devil says, "You brought 16 people down here to die." <laughs> Uh, how many the devil speak bad things to you when things look bad? But I want you to get rejoice. I want you to get up. I want you to get excited. Because no matter what the enemy's point at you, God's got a plan. And God can bring you out. Yeah, get my musicians up here. Those boys planted those machine guns at us. And, and, and said, what are y'all drug runners? What are y'all doing down here? I thought, do we look like drug runners? <laughs> huh? Do we look like drug runners? We work. But God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy. Maria's father knew, the man knew those people. And they let us go on. Now, we went to church for uh, 11 days. In 11 days, we had 80 people born in here. If we had stopped and not followed the plan of God, those 80 people would be lost today. So no matter what the cost, no matter what the price, you've got to fulfill the plan of God. Put your hand over your heart and say, no matter what the cost, no matter what the price, I've got to keep on going to fulfill the plan of God. That night, Esther prayed, God be with you. Because if she made the wrong move, she was going to die. But she made the right move and danced before the king. And the king was so overwhelmed with her beauty, so overwhelmed with her dancing, he held his scepter right there and said, whatever you want, I'll do it. And Esther looks at the king and said, king, said, the only thing I request is that you don't kill me. The king looks at him and said, what are you talking about? I held my scepter right there. I am. I'm not going to kill you. She said, you put out a, a warrant for all the Jews to be killed. Haman has sent them out to kill all of them. And I am a Jew. I am, a, I am one of those people that you are going to kill. And the Bible said her request turned the heart of the king. How many of God can turn the worst second circumstance that you have into something great? King looked at Esther and said, What can I do? She, he said, Save my people. He not only saved the people, but he took Haman and his sons out and hung them on the gallows. See, you, you got to be careful about building things against God's people. You lie to hang yourself. Can I get an amen? Because if God be for us, who can be? I will say it one more time. If God be for us, who can be against us? Give God a praise and you can choose. Let's receive an offering. I feel the Lord in you. Hallelujah. Praise God.